Life, like the conversation, keeps changing. Get the first ever needs matched life insurance that changes as your life changes. Good evening. Welcome to another lockdown edition of the Dan Nichols Show with Brian Trog in what is a very special week because our charity partners, Laureus, are celebrating 20 years. Monday was the 20th anniversary of Laureus. We produced a television special that went out on Supersport on Monday night. If you missed it, it's on Catch Up or being repeated. But it's well worth having a look at two decades of celebrating the power of sport for good in action and seeing just how Laureus has taken the words of Nelson Mandela that sport has the power to change the world and done exactly that. So we're celebrating Laureus this week. In fact, I have a fellow Laureus ambassador of mine on the show. Dean Furman snuck out of South Africa, said goodbye to the country and got back to the UK just in time for the arrival of his first little one, baby Furman, due any day now. Dean joins us on the show from Manchester. And we're also in Montpellier with Bismarck Duplessis, the big South African hooker, just signed a brand new two-year contract with his French club. But first up, the reason for my hair looking completely unplayable, it's because I'm trying to look as much like my favorite Welshman as I possibly can. He is an Olympic gold medalist, he's a world champion, he's won the Tour de France, and most importantly, he's the most famous Welshman since Tom Jones. Hello, Jared, how are you? Good, thanks. I don't know if I would take that as a compliment or, uh, or not. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> now my wife actually cuts my, well, hasn't cut it for a while actually to be fair but normally my wife does it anyway so I'm all right well, I've got both my wife and my five-year-old daughter threatening to cut my hair I've held <laughs> out thus far uh, it might not last too much longer we've uh, we've never spent time in person but we have met sort of digitally uh, we go back last year and the uh, the DHL dinner in Hong Kong which uh, you weren't able to make and then jumped on very generously and uh, and joined us via video call and we managed to to sell one of your jerseys for a, a significant amount of money so it's it's, it's great to to renew the acquaintance of sorts in in really strange times uh, what's the last little stretch been like for you yeah it's been it's not so bad now i'm back in in monaco now and we're, we're able to train on the roads and um stuff starting to open but prior to that uh, I went back to Cardiff with my family, with my wife and my, well, five-month-old son at the time. Now he's, yeah, seven or whatever. It's, it's just flies by, doesn't it? But, um, you know, and I'm just seeing seeing Max, Max is his name, and um, seeing him develop and, and, you know, changing on a daily basis was just mad, really. And, you know, everyone goes on about it. But until you have kids yourself and you actually see it, it's, uh, it's another thing. So um, that was really nice as well. But um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to hopefully getting back to a bit more normality soon and hopefully to a bit of racing and things. But obviously there's uh, bigger things to, to sort out in the meantime. Where does the balance sit for you? On, on one hand, desperately missing competing and being on the bike. On the other, an unusually long stretch of time with the family watching Max grow up. And does one sort of cancel out the other? Yeah, it's kind of... Um, I tend to try and just look at the positives in any sort of situation I'm in anyway. So, um, yeah, I just saw it as extra time with them, extra time with, with Max and, and just like, yeah, being a dad really, I guess. And, and something which I wouldn't have really had the chance to do. Like if, if it was a normal season, I would have seen him oh, easily like 75% less to be fair. After a few weeks, I was looking forward to a racing or training camp just to get away from him for a bit of sleep. But because uh, he started teething as well. So during lockdown in Cardiff, he had about four teeth come through um, one after the other. So that was, uh, that was challenging. But um, yeah, it's all good. It'll be a good source of pain next time you're in a, a major race and it's starting to hurt. You can think, well, I could be up at three in the morning with a teething toddler. This is much better. <laughs> exactly, exactly. 
Until then, we've had to rely on nostalgia and watching old races, the 2018 Tour de France being a, a particular favorite of mine. As we look back over your career, we often have our own opinions as to what the greatest moment of a certain athlete is. You've got Olympic gold medals, you've won world championships, you've won the Tour de France. Are you able to pick one as the overall highlight? Oh, they're obviously all, they're all really special, but I think the Tour is, is different. I think to have won that is just incredible, really. I still sort of pinch myself. So um, if I had to choose, I'd definitely say that would, would be the the biggest but obviously the olympics as well uh you know london olympics especially you know a home home olympics was just insane so uh yeah very fortunate to have a few nice victories to choose from fast forward to 2023 and here's your choice and i'll give you a moment because it's not an easy one you've got two options one of them is you win another tour de france that year the other is Wales get to beat the Springboks in the Rugby World Cup final? Which one do you pick? Huh, I knew that was coming. Uh, I think I'd probably be selfish and take the take the win. And the boys, they can win in the one after that. What's that? 2029. 20, 27. Seven, seven. Sorry, lockdown's done my brain in. Oh, well, I think we'd be happy with that. You can take the Tour de France, we'll take the rugby. Uh, we'd also like to bring you to South Africa, and just before we let you go back to uh, some more sleep before the toddler uh, is up again, there's a race we have here in South Africa. It's not a road race in the sense that you're normally riding in, but it's one that's got pretty well known around the world. And I know Daryl Limpy, who's a good friend of yours, is quite keen to ride it when his professional career starts to taper off. And that is the Absa Cape Epic. Any thoughts of, uh, of one day? joining the other former road riders and, and coming out to join us there well that would be nice it's uh i know it's a challenging uh circuit that's for sure because i used to race with barla world who um they obviously got south african links so i heard a lot about it then but oh it, it's just all the snakes and stuff and the wildlife that puts me off a bit you know like don't get any of that in cardiff it's just uh yeah i don't know the odd cat or something running across the the path but uh no, that would be good to do. It would be good to do. Uh, we'd, we'd love to have you out. But before that, we'd love to see you and the rest of the cycling world back on bikes. I know our guys uh, down here with Team NGT Dacoma can't wait to get racing. And I think that uh, applies to everybody. So uh, good luck when it does happen. Enjoy the time with the family. And uh, don't uh, don't worry too much about the sleepless nights. When they get to the three, it's just Peppa Pig all day and throwing spaghetti on the ceiling. So you'll have different challenges to face. I'm sure. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Jared Thomas, thank you very much indeed. Tour de France winner, Olympic champion, and probably the most famous Welsh person we'll ever have on the show. There have been many low points over the last few months as lockdown has hit us all, but nothing has been nearly as sad, nearly as devastating as having to say goodbye to Dean Furman as our top footballer jumped on a plane and dashed out of Dodge just a couple of weeks ago. You've left a very, very sad South Africa behind Dean Furman. Hello. Hi, Dan. Please keep it together. Um, it's still great that we can see each other like this. But no, incredibly sad way to leave uh, under the current circumstances. To end five wonderful years in South Africa was, was really, really upsetting. I only hope that I'll be back uh, sooner rather than later and in much better times. I have no doubt you will. It was a very hurried departure. Talk us through the mechanics because you, you seem to leave uh, very, very suddenly. Yeah, so uh, I had to act quickly. My wife is is pregnant and, and ready to give birth kind of any day now. So I was under time constraints. I knew that once I got here back to the UK as well, that I wanted to go into some sort of self-isolation. So I had to factor that in before the birth, trying to get back. The borders, as you know, are completely closed. It wasn't easy getting out of South Africa Flights were getting cancelled, flights were getting postponed. Um, so yeah, time wasn't really on my side. So when one flight kind of said it was going, I said, yeah, please, I'll have that. Uh, desperately need to get on that flight. So yeah, very thankful to the airline, uh, to everyone who organised it, and uh, thankfully got back to the UK safe and sound, did my two weeks of, of self-isolation, quarantine, uh, and now I'm back with my wife and, and uh, told her she can give birth now whenever she's ready. 
What was that moment like when you first saw Tash, saw little Furman, who's now close to arrival? That that must have been as special as anything you felt in a while. It was absolutely fantastic. In fact, um, for the first two weeks, we kept our two metres distance. So uh, that's that's been very, very hard. She came to visit me, but we kept a long way apart. We were walking on pretty much on, on... either sides of the road um so once that self-quarantine it almost made it even harder because i couldn't give her a hug i couldn't give the little bump a kiss uh to tell it that i'm there and that i'm ready and that that uh, you, you can come and join us um but since since the quarantine's over and we've, we've had a we've had a nice hug um things seem to be a little bit back to normal and um yeah all smiles on our faces at the moment We've known for some time that you were looking to bring your stay in South Africa to an end, uh, and you've now headed back. Uh, what awaits from a football perspective? Yeah, the football was incredible, and I, I have stressed that that the decision to to leave South Africa was to be closer to the family, and it wasn't necessarily a football decision. Um, being with SuperSport, um, not necessarily the, the the biggest club in in South Africa, certainly from a, a fan base perspective. Um, but in terms of success, incredible five years, five, uh, seven cup finals, four trophies, um, and something that I'm very proud of up to this point, Kaiser Chiefs or, or Pirates didn't win a single trophy during my time there. And I think that's, that's a measure of our success and a few other teams that have, that have been successful over this time, that the two so-called biggest teams in the country uh, weren't able to, to win any silverware. So that's something that I'm, I'm particularly proud of. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how the season ends to see if they can win their first trophy since I've left. Speaking of which, if the season doesn't restart, what would you do? Would you give Chiefs the title? Uh, no, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that, that what started needs to finish. And I think there's teams who are, who are chasing them down. So absolutely wouldn't give them the trophy. For me, they has to find a way to complete the season. And uh, I really hope in the coming weeks and months that, that they're able to do so. Uh, Kaiser Chiefs fans, Dean Furman is now living in Manchester. If you need to find him, that's where you go off to uh, to raise that issue with him. Speaking of Manchester, a lot of uncertainty about the future of Paul Pogba at Manchester United. Suddenly Dean Furman arrives, like for like replacement in so many ways. <laughs> uh, possibly Old Trafford, but but if not, what, what does hold uh, your footballing future in store for you? Uh, Going to have to sit sit tight for a little while. Um, be patient, but hopefully in uh, in the, in the next few weeks we'll be able to have some good talks with some clubs um, who who may seem interested, and then probably next month we we might be able to sit down and have some some concrete talks and, and start looking at some contracts. What about country? Are you still available for Bafana? I will still be available. I've, I've spoken to Coach Malifi. I've spoken to uh, to the president of of Safa. So. We've had a good chat. They understand my position. Um, and I will be, what I've said to them is that once I, I sign at a club, um, let's sit down, let's have an open and honest discussion about how we can proceed with Bafana because there's no greater honour than, than pulling on that, that uh, Bafana jersey for me as a footballer. It's, it's given me the, the, the highlights of my career. There are so many wonderful football memories you left us with. All the fans have got their own particular favourite Dean Furman moments. If you had to pick one game in a Bafana jersey and one game in a Supersport jersey as the the pick of the bunch, what would they be? The game that stands out for me is is the 6-1 victory over Pirates. And I think that the amazing thing about that game was that we actually went in 1-0 down at half-time. Um, so it wasn't like we we scored those six goals over 90 minutes. We scored them in 45 minutes. It was probably the most incredible 45 minutes of my career. Um, it's just everything we did led to a goal. It was insane. Uh, for Bafana, uh, there's probably two. My debut against Brazil, where I'm, I'm, we're singing the national anthems. I'm looking to my left and my right, and I'm, well, down to my left, I'm seeing Neymar and David Luiz and Hulk. And Oscar, I'm seeing all these these superstars. I'm thinking, goodness me, is this a game of FIFA? What's going on here? Um, so that that was an incredible place to, to for a debut. And I think the other highlight has to be that the victory, the recent victory over Egypt in the Afcon uh, last 16. 
it was 75,000 Egyptians in the fan in the crowd um, going wild. Nobody gave us a chance. And our performance of Mo Salah, who had lit up the tournament up to that point, um, nobody gave us a, a sniff. And uh, something in us just said, this is ours tonight. We've got this. And, and our performance was incredible. Uh, and to be applauded off by the Egyptian fans at the end of the game it was, was a mark of, of how good we were on the night. It was an incredible game, as was that win over Pirates. But you had so many of them, Dean, and that's what makes it uh, all the sadder to have to say goodbye to you as a footballer. But for those of us who've got to know you as a friend and as a mate, it's Dean Furman, the person we're going to miss even more than the footballer. Uh, we know where you've gone back. It's a really exciting time for you and Tash. Uh, and can't wait uh, for little Daniel Furman to make his arrival. Uh, but in the meantime, enjoy getting your feet back in the UK. We're excited to see where your football club career takes you next. And I know it won't be too long until we have you back in South Africa. Thanks, Dan. It's a, it's a pleasure as always. And there we go. Dean Furman, Bafana skipper, Super Sport United skipper, and possibly the new Paul Pogba. Now, during the course of the Dan Nichols show in lockdown with Brian Drog, we've heard a couple of quite interesting accents. And up until now, probably the pick of them has been CJ Stander's Afrikaans Irish. But we're about to go one better as we catch up with an Afrikaans Frenchman and say, Ça va, Monsieur Bismarck du Plessis? Ça va, Monsieur Dan Nichols? <laughs> I have to say I'm really impressed. We've been chatting quite a bit on WhatsApp over the last week or so, almost exclusively in French, which has stretched my schoolboy French to its very limits. You, you seem to have become completely French, Bismarck. <laughs> of everything except completely French. The thing is, I just learned French. So when people talk uh, talk behind or talk in front of us about us, then I can know exactly what they say. <laughs> well, most of what they'll be saying in Montpellier will doubtless be pretty good and pretty positive because they they obviously love you. They've just signed you for another two-year contract. Félicitations, mon ami. Oh, merci. C'est vraiment, euh, pour moi, c'est un grand, grand euh, théâtre parce que je pense que c'est mon dernier match euh, contre Apo, mais maintenant, on va signer deux ans de plus. And if you don't speak French, you didn't understand that. What Bismarck just said is, I know I'm very happy, but I'm still 15 years younger than Skulk Brits when he was still playing rugby. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it, it's obviously a great honour, and it speaks to two things. One, that they're still loving having you there, and the other, that both on and off the field, you're clearly having a good time in Montpellier. Yeah, it, we, we are really settled in well, and... We're enjoying uh, our lifestyle here. Um, and the thing is, I was almost uh, in a month and a half time, I would have been sitting on the farm and uh, watching you on TV every weekend. Uh, and then they said, uh, oh, you watch Dan Nickel every weekend, do you sit in France? So then I picked France. <laughs> I would have done exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> To tell us about the Montpellier team, about the community you're part of. What is so special? Why has it become such a such a fond home for you? Oh, the thing is, that, uh, I won't say it, it was always easy. Um, coming here, uh, not knowing how the, the whole system works and how we will settle in, because I was very settled at the Sharks and I was staying, I was 11 years or eight years in the same house. Um, knew everybody in Durban and enjoying Durban. It was a good challenge for me. I just got married and moved here and uh, there was no TV on uh, that I could understand. And my, my wife fell pregnant after not even two weeks in France and we were blessed with two twin boys and took me out of my comfort zone. Yeah, interesting correlation there. No television to watch and two weeks later, Mrs. Duplessis falls pregnant. I think there might be a link there somewhere, Bismarck. Uh, it's not difficult to understand that one. <laughs> uh, you're enjoying it a lot in a, a very different part of the world. What, outside of the language, was the biggest change? What did you have to adapt to most in France? Uh, speaking one thing that was the most difficult would be the lunch, um, where it's like a two-hour lunch break from 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock. Um, in the beginning, I got there, I ate my food, and I just left. 
Um, and then after being here for six, seven, eight months, I really realized this is the time that they that they really spent together. Because I remember when Fred Michelak was playing with us, when lunch started at 12 o'clock, we used to just rock up, eat and go home and then go and relax before you eat. But Fred will sit at one table, then he'll eat his salad. You always moan about the bread because the bread's horrible um, in South Africa. And then uh, we will leave as a table and you'll sit with the next table coming in. Um, he, he was almost like uh, playing musical chairs, like from from uh, table to table. And he, he ate for two hours every day. And I could never understand it. But now when, when, you, when you stay in France for a while, you really understand why he does that. It's a very big part of the French culture. It's firmly part of Bismarck's culture now as well. Uh, what about the adapting of the last couple of months? How difficult has it been in a country where Corona has had a considerable impact? Um, we've been locked down for about 75 days at the moment. Um, it's been really difficult. Um, I would say the first six weeks was really easy. Um, because you always hear your wife saying, oh, we never spend quality time together as a family. We never spend time as a quality as a family because you're always on the run. But uh, I'd say the, the biggest and toughest thing for me was how it impacted the whole world. Um, if, if you had to suck that out of your thumb, I think nobody would have said uh, it's even possible to, to, to go through a thing like this. Um, but for us... Um, We've been lucky. We we got a big garden uh, that I work in every day, and I play with uh, with with the kids and and, and with my wife, uh, which makes it a lot easier. The the lifestyle is missing a few key aspects that would be day to day in South Africa. What do you miss most about home? What's the uh, what's the South African part that you really wish you had with you in France? Um, family. I would definitely say my family, um, because um, when we stayed in Durban, my family would come down often, uh, spend some time with us and enjoy the time uh, as a family together. And after a game or on a Friday night, <clears throat> spending time together and talking about different things. But uh, being locked down with uh, with my wife and just two boys, I, I didn't leave the house for seven weeks. I left it, I left the house twice in seven weeks. Um, I did go for a run every day, but you only allowed to run a kilometer around the house. Um, and I would definitely say my family I miss the most. I know a few front row forwards who would argue that a kilometer around the house is probably a kilometer too far. So <laughs> nice to see you keeping fit and healthy. And you're clearly still in great shape. You're clearly still loving the rugby. You've signed on for another two more years. And then have you given thought after that? Is it, is it back to the farm in Bethlehem? I'm definitely coming back to the farm in Bethlehem, but uh, there's a few opportunities uh, that, that we're working on here, especially for the World Cup, uh, bringing out a wine. It's called the Grand Melee. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a rugby field vineyard uh, all over the world, in South Africa, um, in New Zealand, in Australia, in France, uh, and in Los Angeles. So uh, getting that, uh, doing something uh, with that with Fred Michelet, um, trying to get that into the stadiums uh, because, as you know, we all love a scrum in, in France. It would be remiss of me before I let you go, Bismarck, not to ask you one crucial question. And I think this is the question that all South Africa will be asking. Uh, we'd love to see you back in South Africa. We'd love to see you playing again for South Africa. But I think what we'd love most is to see a sequel to that famous commercial of yours, that you pulled off so beautifully. Uh, any chance of another one? Pump, but he dumb pump. Pump, pump. <laughs> good, eh? Oh, dear. Uh, Bismarck, it's lovely to see you in such good spirits. It's lovely to hear that things are going so well. Congratulations again on the new contract. Uh, stay you. safe, family in France. Uh, enjoy the time left. And uh, yeah, as soon as you're back in South Africa, a uh, two hour lunch with some of your new brand of wine with Fred Michelet. Merci beaucoup, mon ami, et bon courage, et ciao.
de rien. C'est le roi de Montpellier, the king of Montpellier. Brand new contract, two more years to go. And don't believe a word he says. Look out for Bismarck Duplessis, the Springbok jersey at the 2023 Rugby World Cup. Thanks, Dave. So Bismarck giving us a Gallic farewell to this week's show. Big thank you too to Dean Furman. Good luck with the arrival of the little one. And Gerard Thomas giving us a touch of Welsh cycling magic on the show this week. Well done again to Laureus. Thank you for everything you've done over the last 20 years and for the opportunity to be able to support your fantastic week. Stay safe, look after each other. I'll see you again next week. Good night. Life, like the conversation, keeps changing. Get the first ever needs-matched life insurance that changes as your life changes.